Hi, this is just a quick 10 minute video to go through the 10 rules or the 10 steps and hopefully make it a little bit simpler uh, because the 10 rules is a really good way to do a systematic review of the ECG to lead you down a pathway. So to lead you down a pathway that something's wrong or something needs to be further investigated with that rule because it's um, or that step because it's there's an abnormality detected there. Um, so even in the most chaotic ECGs, this gives a really good structured way to look at it basically. Um, so the first step is all waves are negative in AVR. When we talk about negative um, leads, it's all below the isoelectric. So um, all, all below the, P, the PR to the ST is where you look at the isoelectric and predominantly all the leads are negative from there. If they're not, there can be a couple of different reasons. The ones that are important to us in the pre-hospital field is that you basically have the leads, the limb leads on the wrong, wrong way. Um, if they're on the right way, um, the next thing to look at is that uh, whether we've got axis deviation. So axis deviation is seen in lead one and lead two, um, and that's about the QRSs either pointing towards each other or pointing away from each other. This is essential to look at a number of different things, such as like triavesicular blocks and um, some other disease states where patients will just present with a faint fit or a bit of a funny turn. Um, that, however, needs to be another five minute video because it's, it's a little bit more in depth. But that's the next reason why they want you to look at um, why all leads should be negative. The third one is that you can have, um, is essential to look at the AVR when you've got an inferior MI. So your inferior leads being two, three and AVF. If you've got an inferior MI, look to your AVR. If your AVR has no changes, you've got a 1% mortality rate for this patient group. If there's ST depression, these patients have a 16.5% mortality rate. If there's ST elevation with this inferior MI, a patient has a 27.7% mortality rate. So it basically just tells you that this patient's at higher risk of decline and quite quickly. Why that is, is because where AVR, this forgotten lead, is looking at, it's looking at left main stem um, or quite high up in the LAD. So if that occlusion is up there, and that's what's caused the inferior, it's, um, it's um, quite substantial, basically. Uh, so it's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, the most important one is, or well, the most important one, I think, with um, AVR looking at it, is if you've got diffuse ST depression, so in all the other leads, there's uh, more than half a mil of ST depression, look to your AVR. If your AVR has elevation, this is 93% specific, for left main stem disease or um, acute blockage, basically, or quite high up in the LAD. So these patients um, need further investigation, basically. So it's something to not be subsided, that ST depression with that elevation. If there's no elevation, it, 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 um, it's not as um, obviously important. There might be another cause for the ST depression. Uh, so that's kind of step one, uh, hopefully cleared up a little bit. Uh, step two is the ST starts at the isoelectric. I think that's pretty clear. I don't really need to go through it. And I will do another video on uh, STEMIs and inferior and posterior and all that sort of stuff. Most people know how to see a STEMI and what the criteria is for it though. Uh, the main thing with this one is look at it in groups. Look at all your inferior leads together. Look at your anterior leads together and so on and so forth. Uh, so you look at it in a systematic way rather than just across the paper. Uh, step three is uh, the PR interval is between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20. So the PR interval is measured obviously from the first bit of the P and then the first bit of the Q. So the first bit that comes away from that isoelectric line. That's really important when you are measuring because sometimes a machine doesn't see it correctly. If it's over 0 0.20, we see this a lot and then you get, uh, but this indicates that you, you have some type of AV block. So this again should pathway you down to look at um, what type of block with a long rhythm strip. Is it a first, second, third degree block? And I'll do a, another video on that one as well. Uh, but basically that just tells us that we've got block there. Uh, less than 0 0.12, that suggests that these patients are vulnerable to pre-excitation syndromes. So pre-excitation syndromes, the predominant one being wolf Parkinson white And because the electricity, instead of going through a nice predefined electrical pathway, it goes through the bundle of Kent, which is an accessory pathway through the left um, atria. Um, again, I can explain that more a wolf and white on another video, but it should pathway you down there. The main take home from that is if you've got a short PR interval, less than 0 0.12, and this is a young patient that had a faint fit or funny turn, or just didn't feel right, 
that just didn't feel right was probably them having an arrhythmia, like a, a, a potentially life-threatening arrhythmia. So though that's, that's a high-risk patient that needs further investigation rather than just, you know, having enough to eat, drink, uh, whatever we, we could kind of look at elsewise. Um, so that is the, the PR intervals there. Uh, step four is the QRS uh, should not exceed 0 0.12. So if it is exceeding that um, 0 0.12, it indicates significantly lowered ventricular depolarization. So this can happen with a number of different things like your bundle branch blocks. Uh, you can also get um, uh, past MIs, current MIs, there's a whole lot of different ones. It in isolation needs to be taken in consideration of the whole patient, basically. Measuring the QRS becomes more relevant when you're comparing uh, VT to other things like um, SVT with aberrancy, which is another video in itself. Um, but it's more about, um, that. that's more, again, triggers you down. Okay, it's wide, why is it wide? Is it so wide that this is a VT? Or is it just wide because it's got a bundle branch block, basically? So that's step four. Uh, step five, we've got uh, the QRS and the T waves uh, tend to be in the same direction. So this is talking about concordance. So the QRS pointing, say it's pointing upwards, the T wave pointing upwards as well. What I draw into this rule is also step 10, where we look at the T wave is upright and rounded in two, three, and V2 to V6. So I look at the T waves in, in all together kind of thing. What it's basically saying is, do you have biphasic or flip Ts? Flip T's is obviously, instead of the pointing up, they're pointing down, and that's you've got disconcordance. They're pointing a different way, the QRS, compared to the T. Or you've just got, um, uh, you've got abnormal T waves. They're, they're really deep, they're hyper, they're, you know, there's, there's so many different abnormalities with a T wave. Uh, when I looked up, there was about 68 different reasons you can get a T wave abnormality. So there's lots of different reasons and you need to put that into consideration with your whole patient assessment and, and, and what's most likely. Um, the, the big one there is if you've got, um, the big one that we talk about is, is PEs basically. And there's a lot of talk about S1, Q3, T3 and a few other different ways to work out what you'll see in the ECG. S1, Q3, T3 has about a 20% incident rates with PEs. The thing in the research that I found was more relevant for us in a pre-hospital field is if a patient is tacky and flip T's, think PE's. So a patient that's tacky above 100 and they've got flipped or biphasic T's, and what biphasic means is it goes up and then down, or it goes down and then up, um, it goes kind of both ways, that's an indication that in 51% of patients having a PE, they have tacky and flipped T's and or on their ECG. So that's our, our kind of flag, flag to, to say that this patient needs further investigation. Uh, so that's our QRS and T. So step six is that we've got R wave progression, um, or the R wave um, progress from V1 to V4. In, with that, it talks about the ventricular depolarization. Is it really relevant in the pre-hospital field? Not, not overly. Um, as you age, you get less um, R wave progression. And it in isolation, I haven't found a significant amount of evidence to, to really for us to, to look further into it. So moving on to step seven, you've got QRS is upright in uh, one and two. So again, this is same as step one. It's just talking about axis deviation. So if they're not, if they're not both pointing upright, um, you know, they're, they're pointing and coming towards each other or they're pointing and going away from each other, if they're leaving each other, that's a left axis deviation. If they're coming towards each other, that's a right axis deviation. And what that means, again, is, is um, something to be further investigated or by yourself or, or what have you. Uh, so next one is that we've got the P wave in one, P wave upright in one and two and V2 to V6. So again, this is to do with the atria. So if it's not upright and rounded, I pull into there, then we've got some sort of abnormality. The most common ones that you're going to see is you're going to see P pulmonale or P mitrale. So P pulmonale is if you've got peaked P waves, think P pulmonale. And what that is, is a peaked and a sharp P wave indicates that you've got right atrial hypertrophy. And P pulmonale being respiratory, you've usually got the cause being like COPD or something like that. And it's, it's caused that um, right atria to become enlarged and that's what you get on the ECG. 
Same on the left hand side if you've got P mitrali, so you've got an M shaped P wave or a flattened out P wave, uh, it indicates that uh, they've got left atrial hypertrophy uh, and that's P mitrali, mitral valves on the left hand side. Uh, so that's kind of uh, that one there. The last step is uh, no Q waves in 1 to um, V2 to V6. So what they're talking about here is basically pathological Q waves. So if you've got um, Q waves prevalent in those leads, it indicates that you could have pathological Q waves. What they are is, is there's uh, four steps that you can go through to, to look at them, to what indicates they're definitely a pathological Q wave. Uh, but basically they're usually just wide and quite deep and you can see them in V1 to V3. For us, it basically means they've got an acute, it can be acute MI or an old MI, so they've had an MI in, in the past. So it's just something to take in consideration um, uh, in your whole assessment of the patient, basically. But the significance is not as high as probably the other leads that have gone through step one to step uh, four, probably is your main ones there. Uh, so hopefully that's um, made it a little bit simpler and cleared, cleared it up a little bit. Uh, like anything with ECGs, you need to go through it a couple of times. So you need to have the 10 steps there and go through even your normal ECGs and go through it systematically so you get in the habit of doing it because it doesn't just you watch this video and it it's, makes perfect sense. It's something that takes a little bit of time to do uh, continually. So hopefully that's helped and um, yeah, thanks.